reading is taken from Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7, and is on page 690 in the Church Bibles. The Song of the Vineyard. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Almighty, the Lord Almighty, is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So we're thinking today about vineyards, all right? A vineyard, a yard, a, a, a garden, a field, or whatever, where a vine grows. Didcot is a noted vineyard in the world. Did you realize this? We have a vineyard just down the fields. The farmer has planted a load of vines. And if you take a walk, it's a very muddy path at this time of year, but if you take a walk, you can see the vines. Go in a few weeks' time down to the bottom of Great Western Park and follow the path down to West Hagbourne, and you'll see lots and lots of vines, buds bursting and them starting to, to grow. Now, the prophet Isaiah that Kate's just read for us um, he wrote about a vineyard. He sung a song for Israel. Um, and he wanted them to listen because it was a great promise, but it was also a great warning. Things had not gone well. It was a song about a farm. There was a farmer. Does he look like your normal farmer? I don't know. That's maybe what he looked like then. And he's looking out over his farm. He's built a vineyard on a hillside. Now, West Hagborn is hardly a hillside, all right? But in lots of countries with hills, you build a vineyard on the side of the hill that, well, in our side of the world, faces south. I guess if it's Australia, you face north. I don't know. But um, in, in, our, in, in, in Europe and, and in other places, you would, you would build a vineyard on a hillside so all the, all the vines look down into the sun and they can attract the sun and they can grow. You don't want to grow a vine where it's shady. You want the vine to get the sun. How many vines has he got, do you think? How many vines? Do you want to count the number of vines? It's a lot, isn't it? It's hundreds and hundreds of vines. Now, he dug the soil. He got all the big rocks out so that the roots could grow. He, uh, he watered it. He put lots of good stuff in there, lots of muck to make all the soil healthy and, and hearty and he also built a watchtower. Now, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Why would you build a watchtower in a vineyard? Who would attack his vineyard? Who would want to break into a vineyard? Who do you think? Any ideas? Any grown-ups have any ideas? <laughs> Sorry? Competitors, yeah, he might have a nasty farmer down the road who doesn't want him to grow any vines and that the farmer gets in to dig up his vines as revenge because they've had a fight. Yeah, that might be one problem. Um, maybe there's an army coming and he doesn't want them to, to come in and destroy um, and he wants his vineyard to be difficult to get into. Do you know what he might also be worried about? Something that goes... A pig! Yes, that's right. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is get a wild boar inside your vineyard because it will dig up all the vines. Yes. So he builds a wall around his, vi around his vineyard to stop all the, all the pigs from, um, from coming in and digging up um, his, his vines. Now, there's another thing that's not as big as a pig but is just as deadly to a vine. Anybody know what it might be? Yeah? 
Sorry? A scorpion. Ooh, do they eat vines? I don't know. Mmm, yeah. Yeah. Bugs, yes. A weevil, a really pesky weevil, might get in and dig through the bottom of the vine and make a hole in it and eat the inside, and so the whole vine dies. Ah, that's not good, is it? So, um... Can we help Helen, someone help Helen make some uh, seats for the others? They're just coming in. <laughs> uh, there is plenty of room in the front row. Um, um, <clears throat> so, um, and we've got some chairs over here, yeah. So, the, the bugs might get in and destroy the vine. Now, if you can look across the whole vineyard, okay, if you can look across the whole vineyard and see from your tower, you can look out for dangers, can't you? Um, you, can, um, you can spot dangers when they're coming. And that's why he has a watchtower. Now, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was a prophet in Israel. And his job was to warn people, to warn people that danger was coming in Israel. People were turning their back on God. People were turning away from God. Um, and he also, as a prophet, his job was to tell people when their, when their lives were bad when they turned away from God in the way they were living and they were breaking his commandments. So maybe the farmer looks up on, across his vineyard and he can see somebody among the vines and they're digging them all up. Or he can see an army coming. He can see the dust on the horizon. And so he's ready to defend his vineyard and get all his family and friends ready with clubs to drive them away or whatever it might be. He wants to defend them. And Isaiah is saying, that's my job, really. That's my job as a prophet, is to tell you the danger of God's people. Now, that vineyard, says Isaiah, is a picture of Israel. Now, we've been doing the story of Israel on Sunday mornings in our main service. Um, you remember a few weeks ago when we had an all-age service, we thought about the tabernacle, and they made the tabernacle, and they, um, they set off on their journey to the promised land. The people of Israel were taken out of Egypt by God. They were set free. They were redeemed on the night of the Passover. They went across the Red Sea and through the wilderness to the promised land. And God planted them in the promised land just like a load of vines. If you like, Israel living in the promised land was like a vineyard. God's got his people together and he's put them in a safe land. And there they can grow like a, like a vineyard. But... Would they settle down and be the people of God as they should be? Would they live for God? No. They turned away from God. They ignored God. They said, we don't want God in our lives. We want to worship other gods. They fell into sin. And so God said, I will treat them like a vineyard where somebody comes and breaks down the wall." All right. You imagine you've got a vineyard and it's got a big stone wall around the outside to keep the pigs out. can't keep the bugs out, but it can keep the pigs out. What happens if somebody comes and knocks the wall down? What will happen? What will get in? Pigs? Yeah? They will walk in. They'll just walk in. Exactly. Yeah. They'll walk in and they will dig it all up and they'll have a wonderful time. But the farmer won't, will he? Because all his vines are ruined. And actually, Isaiah said, that is what is coming, Israel. An army is going to come from the north. First of all, the Assyrian army. And then after them, the army from Babylon that came, do you remember, in the days of Daniel and took him away uh, to live in Babylon. They're going to come and they're going to destroy this land. And the God's people are going to be scattered because God's people failed God. They turned away from God. They were not the true Israel. They were not the people that they should have been. But, God says, I've got a better vine. And his name is Jesus. And that's who we've come to think about today. The true vine. And he will never let us down. His name is Jesus. They were meant to be this wonderful, flourishing vine but instead, they, they got rotten and they turned away from God. And so um, they, were, they were cast out of the land. They came back and God reestablished them in the land. But even then, 
and they rejected Jesus. Let's, let's learn about Jesus, shall we? Here are some words of Jesus that are right in the middle of the passage we're going to be looking at today. Um, shall we try and say these aloud together, okay? After three, one, two, three. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's quite a lot, isn't it? I'm sorry, I've given you a long verse today, but uh, let's see if we can get into it. You'll understand it by the end of the morning. Let's try again. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Now let's plant a few vines, shall we? There we go. <laughs> can you remember what's behind the, 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 the vines, the grapes? Okay. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. And a few more. Mm, and a few more. Oh, no, let's, let's just do that second one, shall we? <coughs> I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. And one last go. Are you ready? Let's just... Oh, quick look. Yeah, there we go. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Well done. Good morning, church. Yeah. Yes, um, today we'll be reading it's, uh, the scripture. It's John 15, from verses 1 to 8, the New International Version. And it's on um, page 1083. So I'll start and Domalo will continue. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Well done. So Jesus says a really big thing at the beginning of that passage. Are we? There we are. I am the true vine. So Israel were meant to be this wonderful nation living for God and filled with God's goodness and doing his will, and they didn't obey God. And many of them turned out to be false. But Jesus says, I am the true vine vine, the good vine, the vine that does everything that God requires. <clears throat> He's the one perfect man who has ever lived. 
None of us can say, I've always done what my mum and dad told me to, can we? Can we? No, we can't, can we? Because I can't say that. I can't say that. To, to, you know, I could never say that to my mum and dad. <clears throat> None of us have ever done exactly what our dad told us to do. But Jesus is the true vine. He's the one who keeps every one of God's commandments. But he's not just a perfect man. Look at these words at the beginning of that. The, oh, why does it come up like that? There you go. That's a change in formatting. Um, he says, I am... The true vine. And that word, those words, I am, are really important. Really important. I am is the name of God. When God spoke to Israel, he said, Moses said, what shall I call you? Who shall I say spoke to me? And he said, tell them I am has spoken to you. Because God always is. There's never a time before God started. And there's, there'll never be a time when God is dead. And Jesus says, I am. Now, were you noticing earlier in the service, I read some other parts of, the Bible, of John's Gospel where Jesus uses those words, I am. What are some of the other I am sayings of Jesus? One is about something that we eat. I am the bread of life. Yeah. Uh, whoever eats of me will, will um, never go hungry, and so on. Um, he said, I am the light of the world. And he also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said to Mary, whose, whose brother, had died, Lazarus, had died, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. Lots of wonderful statements in John's Gospel that tell us Jesus is a perfect man, but he's also God. And we can find real life in him and trust in him because he's both God and man. Now, Jesus says that he is a vine. And then he also says, my father is the gardener. That's a strange thing, isn't it? What does he mean? <clears throat> he's describing for us what it means for someone who's a Christian to be connected to Jesus. A Christian is someone who comes and trusts in Jesus, who asks Jesus to be their saviour. And when we put our trust in Jesus, we are connected to his life. In fact, it's a bit like, you can see that the vine stalk there. It goes all the way along. There's a branch holding it up. But the vine stalk goes all the way along a frame and back down into the root in the ground. And the vine gets its life from the root, doesn't it? Just in the same way as a Christian gets our life from Jesus. Can I explain it to you with the biggest vine in the world? Anybody been to see this vine? It's in my old county of Surrey. At least, no, it might be in Middlesex, actually. It's, it's by the river. Hampton Court um, vine is the biggest vine in the world. It is 250 years old. It's amazing. It is really astonishing. And that's only half of it. In fact, not even half of it. And um, our son Josh is going to take us to go and see it in a few weeks' time. I'm very excited. Um, it was planted when King George III was king. So a really, really long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and he had some mad ideas. And one of them, I guess, was having a big vine. Um, so he planted this vine. And 250 years later, in this greenhouse, it's still growing. Now, can you imagine what the stem is like where the vine goes into the ground, down into the roots? It's huge. In fact, I haven't got a photo of it because it was copyright and I couldn't use it. But here's, here's something similar. Imagine it's something like that. A great big piece of root sticking out of the ground. The one in Hampton Court's probably bigger than a wheelie bin, just to give you an idea of how big it is. Your big green bin is not as big as the root on the Hampton Court vine. And the roots go under the wall of the greenhouse and they spread out over the ground outside. And the gardeners don't allow anybody to grow anything on the soil outside. They just have a huge heap of soil over the roots and they pile muck on top of it and it's smelly. And they let all the goodness wash down into the roots to feed this huge vine inside the greenhouse. It's an enormous enormous vine and the whole thing works together 
Now Jesus says, I am the vine. I'm the heart of it. I'm the one from whom all the life comes. And you are the branches if you're a Christian. If you remain in me, if you remain connected to me, and if my life flows into you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, if we put our trust in Jesus, if we become a Christian, if we follow Jesus, we're connected to him, and his life comes flowing into us to change us and to make us more like him. What does, what does he give us? Well, he gives us faith. He gives us the faith to trust him. See, we find it hard, don't we, to trust God's promises and, and to know what's going on. But Jesus can strengthen our faith. We feel very guilty, but he gives us forgiveness to take away our guilt. We're very worried about lots of things. Do you lie awake at night worrying about things? Yeah? And he takes away our fear. He gives us peace. A peace sometimes we can't really explain. He gives us strength to resist temptation. We find it very hard, don't we, to walk past the fridge and not open it and take out something to eat. Yeah? And he gives us strength to resist temptation. Some of us are not very successful in this department, but he gives us strength to resist temptation. He gives us wisdom. He feeds our minds with ideas to give us wisdom from his word to make good decisions. Sometimes we have to love other Christians, don't we? And in, in, well, always we have to love other Christians. And we have to love people who aren't Christians. And sometimes they're not easy to love. It's very hard, isn't it, sometimes? He will give us love to be able to keep loving people. Sometimes when we open the Bible... We think, what does that mean? What is God saying? And it's hard to understand. But if we're connected to Jesus, he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us to understand God's word. If we trust in Jesus, then all those things flow into our lives. But there's one other thing here. Jesus says, there's, there's the root of a vine, and I've just thrown in some other vine pictures here. But this one, mm, don't know if you can see, it's quite bright in here. That's the hand of the gardener. Do you know what he's holding? What the tool is that he's holding? It's, it's a pair of secateurs. I could have brought my own today to show you. But a pair of scissors that you use to cut plants. They're very strong. Just, just in here is, is a pair of secateurs. There's the blades. Uh, it looked really clear on my computer at home. But there you go. There's a pair of secateurs. And he's about to cut that shoot there. Okay, um, hmm, very successful picture. Um, if on a vine you have a shoot and it never grows any grapes, maybe it's all withered and feeble and, and, and hopeless, then cut it off, says the farmer, says the gardener. And Jesus is saying, look, there are some people who say they're Christians, but their life never changes. They never fight the battle with temptation. They make silly decisions and they fall into sin. They don't pay any attention to God's word. They never read the Bible. The new life of Jesus just doesn't seem to be there. And after a while, they turn their back on Jesus and they wander away from him completely. And it turns out that they never were Christians in the first place. Jesus says, beware of being a fake Christian. It's like a dead branch that is cut off and the farmer throws it into the fire and it's burnt. And those who think they're Christians, but they never truly are, one day they will be thrown out of God's presence uh, when they die. So beware of, not, of just being a fake, of never really being connected to the life of Jesus. But then, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. Now, this, please don't think about the little black things that you eat called prunes, all right? This is, this is about cutting the branches to make them grow stronger. You see, the problem with a vine is it really grows. It grows like a triffid, and it sends out shoots left, right, and center. And if you let it grow, it will go for miles, miles and miles and miles. But, well, maybe not miles, but, you know, 100 yards. If you cut it, it will grow more grapes. And you don't want just shoots. You want it to concentrate on growing fruit. And actually, when you've grown a, a bunch of grapes and it's starting to form, you want to cut off half the grapes so the other grapes get bigger. 
It's a very delicate job, growing really good quality grapes. Now, God does something similar with every Christian. He cuts us down to size. We're proud of ourselves, aren't we? We think I'm really important and I'm very special and all the rest of it. And he shows us how stupid we are. Sometimes he allows us to do something in our own strength so that we fail, so that we remember how weak we are. Sometimes he takes our dreams. We've got this great dream of something really wonderful and he takes it and he smashes it to keep us humble and to make us trust in him. To realize that we need Jesus above everything else and without him we can do nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Now, can I take you into the Sayers back garden? Okay. When we lived in Abingdon, we had a dustbin. We didn't have a garden, but we did have a dustbin in our yard, and I planted a plum tree in the dustbin. I mean, it wasn't filled with rubbish, it was filled with soil. Yeah, it was an old dustbin, and I made some holes and put some soil in and planted a plum tree. And for years, it grew in that dust dustbin, and it hadn't got much roots, and it kind of struggled. And then we moved to Didcot, and there was a big day when Josh and I tried to pull it out of the dustbin, which was quite hard, and build a, a dig a big enough hole to drop it into and to grow it. And then it really got going. And this is what it looked like last September, at the end of the summer. It had grown shoots, and then those shoots had grown shoots again, and they were so high I couldn't reach up to pick anything that might actually grow on the top. But I have a brother-in-law called Mark, and he works with trees. And he called in and he showed me what you do. And this is what I did. So that's after I'd attacked it with the secateurs. Now, you can't really see what's changed, but this was what it looked like on Thursday morning. Okay? All the leaves have dropped off. And if we go in closely, you can see that each branch is like a, like a hand, isn't it? It's got sort of fingers sticking up to the sky. So all those fingers were great long shoots. And I, he told me, Chuck, cut them down. So there's just two or three buds on each shoot. And, he said, on every one of those shoots, you will get blossom and you'll get fruit. Is he right? Watch this space. I will tell you in a few weeks' time if we get some blossom. And if we get some fruit, I'll tell you. And if the birds don't get it before I do, I'll let you come and maybe we'll bring some to church. I don't know. <clears throat> really hopeful that at last... After its dustbin days, our tree is going to grow some fruit. Now, it's not easy to cut a tree down like that. I felt terrible doing it. It's not easy for us to have our lives cut down to size by God, is it? But sometimes he makes us suffer to make us stronger. And he's training us for something that he has for us to do. But God knows what he's doing. And sometimes it's only when we look back that we see what God has done in our lives and we thank God for the way that he has shaped our lives. Yeah. Um, I want to think about, about fruitfulness um, and what it means to be connected to the fruitful life of Jesus for his fruit to be born in us. Everyone needs to ask this question. It's a really big question. If Jesus is the true vine... How do I get connected to him? How does the life of Jesus come into my life? How do I become a Christian? Do we just hang around other Christians at church, you know, and, and uh, people who clearly are living as Christians, who live changed lives, do we just hang around them and say, um, well, if they're Christians and they're my friends, then I'm a Christian. Or if our parents are Christians, do we think, well, I must be a Christian because my mum and dad are Christians. It doesn't work like that. We have to believe in Jesus for ourselves. And some of the people that followed Jesus thought they were his disciples. They watched him do miracles. They listened to his parables. They liked the way Jesus told stories. But they never really believed on him on the inside. They never turned away from their sin. They never changed. And some people claim to be Christians, but they turn out not to be. And the most obvious example in the Bible of that is Judas. Judas was handed over, Judas handed over Jesus to the Romans, didn't he? He was a traitor, and he came to a terrible end. 
And this is what Jesus says about these people in verse 5 and 6. I am the vine, you are the branches, if, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Let's make sure that we are not fake Christians. Someone who likes just being around other Christians, but doesn't believe in Jesus for ourselves. So what makes someone a real Christian? A real Christian is someone who listens to the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus in the Bible, and they believe it. And because they believe it, they surrender their life to Jesus. And we know that they have believed the message because we see their life changes. A whole load of things change in their lives. Listen to the words of, words of Jesus. He says here in verse 3, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus had spoken to them about why he'd come into the world, who he is, how he was going to die, and how he was going to rise from the dead. He told them all of that so that they could believe in him. And, and these words were great news to his disciples. At least they were. After he'd risen again, they made sense of the whole thing. And it all came together. When they heard the words of Jesus, they believed in him. And it was as though they were cleansed or made clean. Jesus took away their guilt. And they had a clean reputation before God. Jesus took away their past and he made them new. And he still does that today for anyone. Who trusts in Jesus. But the words of Jesus are very important. Look at verse 7. If you've got your Bibles open, look at verse 7. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. How do we keep close to Jesus? We keep close to his word. We read the Bible every day. Uh, we seek to ask Jesus, Lord, speak to me through your words so that it really touches my life. Every day. And when we keep his word in our hearts, when we pray back his word to, to, to God, we, we say, these are your promises and I'm trusting in them. And I want to seek your glory. We can pray to God about anything in our lives. And we find that Jesus gives us what we need to live for him. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, any area of your life. If you want to see God's will in your life, it will be done for you. And this is what he finishes with, some beautiful words. Let's put them up. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If we surrender our lives to Jesus and believe in him, we are like the branch, if you like, almost being connected to the vine for the first time. Sometimes people do that, don't they? They take a, a piece of vine that's different and they graft it into the vine so it starts getting the life of the vine and it starts growing and that's what it's like to become a Christian we're connected to the stem and the root the source of life Jesus is the source of life and we need his power to change and if we believe in him we are in Christ as our song said we're united to Christ and all his life begins to flow into us that means we have a new song to sing doesn't it we're filled with joy for all that Jesus means to us. <clears throat> we are filled with love for Christ and for each other and for a lost world. We have hope. We're not overcome by fear anymore because we have a wonderful hope and nobody can ever take it away from us. The hope that we have in Jesus. And if we serve Jesus and if we have his new life in, him, in, in us, we become like him. He is generous, and we start to be generous as he was. Um, he is kind, and we reflect his kindness. He is pure goodness, and we seek to live a good life, a godly life. He keeps his promises to us, so we must keep our promises to him and to other people. He kept God's commands perfectly, so we seek to keep God's commands as well. We don't live for ourselves. We live for God and not for ourselves. We love the lost and the broken because we realize we were like that before we found Jesus. 
And we want to bring good news to them as well, whoever they may be. Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, that your life is changed, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Well, may God bless his word to us today. We're going to pray together. Let's pray.